own. We are doing this in wonderful collaboration with our friends at the Jewish Theological Seminary and the Riverside Church. And to that end, let me acknowledge the senior minister from the Riverside Church, the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler, and then also the chancellor from the Jewish Theological uh, Seminary, uh, uh, Chancellor Arnie Eisen as well. We thank you all for being with us on this evening. Uh, let me just let you know that uh, shortly after, immediately after Dr. Kim renders his remarks, uh, there will be uh, responses rendered to those remarks by uh, Sarah Saeed, who is Senior Advisor in the Community Affairs Unit for the Mayor's Office here in the City of New York, and Ruth Messenger, the President of the American Jewish World Service. And uh, that response time will be moderated by our own Karenna Gore, uh, who heads up our Center for Earth Ethics, and she will also uh, oversee our question and answer period. Let me say that uh, we've had a number of questions that have been submitted online, and we look forward to them being reflective of the broad expanse of questions that uh, certainly would be a part of an evening like this. Now let me uh, call upon uh, our own uh, president, uh, the Reverend Dr. Serene Jones, who's president and Johnson Family uh, Professor for Religion and Democracy here at Union Theological Seminary, to render words of welcome and then to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Derek. Um, on behalf of Riverside Church and the Jewish Theological Seminary and Union Theological Seminary, what a wonderful threesome. I am very pleased to this evening welcome Dr. Jim Yong Kim to this place to speak on the topic, the principle of mercy. The title of Dr. Kim's speech is inspired by the liberation theologian, John Sabrino. And there is no a more appropriate venue to speak about the topic of liberation theology than right here in this chapel at Union Theological Seminary. It's the home to black liberation theology, womanist and feminist theology, queer theology, liberal theology, social gospel theology, and the list goes backwards in time and reaches forward, awaiting new forms and new possibilities. And it is a place like Union that has for decades engaged in economic discussions about the future of our global reality together that has directly engaged time and again important global institutions like the World Bank where Union asks hard questions about practices, challenges old patterns, asks for new forms of imagination, and pushes pressing issues. It's a wonder that we are having this discussion here tonight in the midst of a world that is wrestling so dramatically, indeed so tragically and so violently, with questions, situations, contexts in which the line between what is a religious conflict and what is an economic conflict what is a social conflict and a faith conflict can hardly be distinguished and pulled apart as if they were two pennies that could be separated and exchanged in equal value. We see increasingly that we live in a world where questions of meaning, questions of our shared understanding of the meaning of our lives together on this planet and the pressing economic issues and issues related to violence are woven tightly into the single thread that either holds us together or pulls us apart and strews us into the universe. Dr. Kim's visionary leadership at the World Bank has flow, ha, flows out of a lifetime of commitment to asking these questions. He has set for the World Bank the goal of ending extreme poverty. Is there any greater act of mercy? Than that. And I do truly mean that this goal and this question has come out of a lifetime in that his earliest moral convictions, I'm very proud to say this evening, were shaped by his mother, Osuk Kim, who happens to be an alumni of Union Theological Seminary in the 1950s. 
And we are very privileged this evening to have with us her brother, Hern Chong, who was a student in the 60s at Perkins School of Theology as a Methodist uh, seminarian. And to my great delight, I learned this evening studied with my father 50 years ago. A family deeply, deeply soaked in the language of faith and the convictions and the forms of life that flow from that. Out of these convictions came a man who co-founded with Paul Farmer and Ophelia Dahl, Partners in Health, which has saved the lives of tens of thousands of people through medicine and vaccinations. I remember reading about the work of Partners in Health for the first time, and there were the words of liberation theologians put right next to the words of medical doctors. I was 32, and I had never seen such a thing happen. It was a miracle. I remember that moment so clearly. To have a man that participated in the creation of even that vision here in this place, bringing us now pressing economic questions, is a part of that miracle. He has served as the executive director of Partners in Health, director of the World's Health Organization's HIV AIDS department. He was professor and then chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And from 2009 into 2012, he was president of Dartmouth College. And then in April of 2012, he was elected the 12th president of the World Bank. I am eager to hear your thoughts, President Kim, on the principle with mercy. Without further ado. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, uh, President Jones. And uh, it's a, it's great to be here. You know, I, I know that this is a this is an old chapel, and so um, I. I uh, have to think that my mother was here uh, uh, many, many, many times in the 1950s. Uh, you, you know, let me start by talking a little bit about the title, The Principle of Mercy. Uh, it's a book, actually, by, um, by John Sabrino. And many of you may know that um, he was actually a professor at the University of Central America and happened to be outside of El Salvador when, in 1989, um, one of the paramilitary groups came and killed, um, I think it was six professors, Alicuria, um, uh, uh, Ignacio Martin Baro and many others, their housekeeper and her daughter. And it was one of the most horrific acts. And I, and I, I was actually here in Washington, in, not here, but in Washington, D.C., at an American Anthropology Association meeting when we heard that this had happened. And this was at the time, um, uh, not long before, uh, uh, where uh, there was the death also of Oscar Romero. So uh, these were very, uh, 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 these were very impactful moments for us. And, and I think, um, I've never met Jan Sabrino. Many of you probably know him. I've never met him. I don't know that he would agree with what I'm doing with his, uh, his book and his quotes. Uh, but the thing that struck me is that there was an energy, uh, an intensity in his writing after that event, um, being the one of this particular group that had survived. But what he wrote, and, and, and there, there are some other quotes, but he said that the basic structure, and I quote, the basic structure of this response to this world's victims, uh, uh, that the structure consists in making someone else's pain our very own and allowing that pain to move us to respond. But then he also said, and I quote, the danger is that it may seem to denote a sheer sentiment without a praxis to accompany it. And so uh, uh, Paul Farmer and I uh, met in 1983 and we've been working together more or less and we continue to uh, for, for 30 plus years now. And uh, the question that we have been asking is what is to be done? What do you do in the face of the suffering in the world? What do you do in the face of poverty in the world? And uh, we had some small answers, very focused uh, community-based answers. But the, the, ans the, the question that, that, that struck me most was uh, how, do you, how do you embrace the whole of the problem and make progress. Now, um, let me first tell you about how, I, I hope it's okay, I wanna share with you sort of uh, uh, the, the, the evolution of my own thinking process, and it really does start here. Uh, my mother uh, was a refugee, as was my father. My mother uh, was a war refugee along with my uncle. Um, during, the, during the Korean War, 
they had to literally um, uh, uh, get on a boat and go down to the southern part of Korea because the war was raging around Seoul at the time. Uh, both my, my, my uncle and my mother lost their mother during the war. Um, uh, and uh, somehow my mother found her way first to Skerritt College in Tennessee uh, on a scholarship uh, from a women's organization uh, because she happened to be the top student at the top high school in, in Korea. So they offered two scholarships to the top two students, and she was one. And she came at the age of 18 or 19 and studied at uh, Skerritt College in Tennessee, uh, then uh, uh, applied to two theological seminaries, uh, Harvard and Union, but at the time, Harvard didn't take women. So she was one of four women in her class um, uh, starting, uh, uh, I don't remember the exact year, 1950, 1953 or four, I think, 55. That's right, 55. Um, and she studied here with people like Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, Robert McAfee Brown. Her advisor and someone she kept in touch with for a very long time uh, was Professor Daniel Day Williams. And we, we grew up hearing about these people and their ideas. Um, uh, I, we had volumes of Tillich's systematic theology, and uh, as a high school kid, I tried to thumb through it, and I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. But she describes uh, being here, studying philosophy and theology, and she said it was like learning to paint in Paris at the time of Van Gogh. And uh, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was an awakening for her uh, that has impacted all of us uh, uh, children uh, and even our, you know, our children for many, many years. My father uh, was, on the other hand, among the most practical people um, I've, I've ever known. He's a dentist. Uh, dentists are, uh, by nature, I think, extremely practical people. And they actually met in the United States. They met here in New York City. At the time, uh, there were uh, probably three or 400 Korean students in all of, uh, all of the United States. And in the 1950s, they would all get together at parties, and uh, a friend introduced my mother to my father. So they actually married here in New York City, and my older brother was born in 1958 here in New York City. And then right after he was born, we went back to the United States. Um, excuse me, back to, back to Korea. And I was born, and my sister was born uh, in Korea. So um, just to give you a sense of what that was like, so 1950. 1959, we go back to Korea. I was born in December of 1959. And in 1959, Korea was one of the poorest countries in the world. And not only was it one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, but I went back and looked at World Bank documents. And the World Bank documents in the 60s, 60, 61, uh, were all extremely negative about South Korea. And they were saying, this is a country that is basically hopeless. Uh, the level of uh, the number, the percentage of uh, Koreans who were college educated was less than 5% uh, in, the, in the 1950s. Uh, the number of people who were literate was around 20%. And all of the industry and mineral wealth was in the northern part of Korea, north of the 38th parallel. So the prediction was that the north would do quite well, but the south was hopeless. So the southern half of Korea didn't qualify for even the most concessional, the 0% interest loan that we give only to the poorest countries, it didn't even qualify for one of those loans until 1964. And the, 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 the documents are, are, pretty, are pretty clear saying this country is just hopeless, forget it. We're not, you know, there's no chance. It doesn't have the uh, entrepreneurship of Taiwan and it doesn't have enough Western influence. It's too Confucian. They, they, they talked about, um, and these were other development economists, they talked about Korea is a land of Confucian fundamentalism. And because of that, not enough Western values, capitalism will never take root. In, uh, in, in Korea. And then, you know, probably about 15, 20 years later, uh, no longer than that, maybe 25 years later, when the Korean economy was booming, the development economists came back and said, you see, they're doing so well because of Confucianism, right? So <clears throat> one, thing, one thing I've learned about economists that's very different from medical doctors is that economists can get it wrong every single time, year after year after year, and we keep going back and asking their opinion uh, because it doesn't matter uh, as much. I keep, I keep telling my, my, uh, my colleagues, the economists at the, at the bank, you know, if I made as many errors as you guys did, I would be in jail as a medical doctor. Um, uh, but so they met, they went back to 64, 
because there was so much turmoil. I mean, there was, uh, there was demonstrations in the streets. The situation in terms of poverty was, was as I described it. And they, they came back because they thought that, the, that we would have a much better chance to, to have an education by coming uh, to the United States. So we went first to Dallas, Texas, where then my, my uncle and uh, um, uh, aunt came in 1966. And then uh, we moved from there to a place where my father felt that, that it would be certain that he would be able to get patients. Uh, you know, uh, in the 1960s, it's, 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 uh, it's, um, uh, it's hard to conceive of it, and my children just have no idea what I'm talking about. But I was, um, I was a six-year-old, and I was in uh, uh, Highland Park uh, Presbyterian Church daycare. And the kids there had never seen uh, an Asian before. And the kids would literally come up to me, and uh, Assumption, you remember this, right? They would slap me across the face and call me flat face. Right? And uh, I, uh, I went into the uh, house of a, of a young friend of mine once, and his older brother came and screamed and yelled at me to get out of the house because racism was extremely severe. Um, one of the greatest football players uh, of uh, all time in Dallas, Dallas history, uh, Bob Hayes. I, I don't know if any remember Bob Hayes, right? experiences was just this reaction against um, trying to be acceptable within a mostly uh, uh, white American Christian context. And I got very much into identity politics. And uh, identity politics was sort of the thing we would, you know, uh, uh, I, I was part of the Third World Center, African American, Latino, and Asian American kids. We used to do uh, protests during Parents Weekend. You know, there would be like 30 African American kids, 20 Latino kids, and me, right? Because <laughs> the other Asian, other Asian kids weren't really into that. But for me, it was just the coolest thing on earth because I had grown up with a mother who had me be reading uh, uh, James Baldwin and Martin Luther King when I was like 12 years old. So it was, it, it, it was identity politics. And then, I, and then um, uh, I, one day, I came home from Brown, and, and uh, my father picked me up at the airport. And he said, so Jim, what do you want to study? He said, you know, I said, Dad, you know, I, I'm, I'm really interested in politics and philosophy, and uh, that's what I want to study. And it's a true story. He literally pulled the car over to the side of the road. He looked back at me and said, you know, when you finish your residency, you can study anything you want. <laughs> and, 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 and he, now, now I'll tell you, you know, when I tell this story to a group of Korean American, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 elderly people or, or people in my parents' generation, not a single person laughs. They just shake their head, of course, you know, you know yeah, of course. Uh, and, but it was really important for me because, uh, uh, you know, it, having my father there grounded me uh, in a way. He, and, he, and he used to talk like this. He said, what do you, you think you're going to study philosophy? You think people are going to pay you to tell them what you think, what your philosophy is? You're a Chinaman. You're a Chinaman in this country. You're going to need a skill if you're going to survive. And uh, so I'm very, I'm very grateful for him, uh, to him that, that, uh, that I did that because it turned out to be a pretty good strategy. So I uh, uh, went to Harvard Medical School uh, from, from Brown. I actually, I actually uh, really wanted to go to the University of California at San Francisco, because then I could go to UCSF, be with my people, Asian Americans, Asian American activists. And he said, oh, so UCSF versus Harvard. And you tell me you're going to go to UCSF. He said, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up going to Harvard Medical School. And that also turned out to be a fantastic decision, because they had just started an MD-PhD program in medical anthropology. So I did my MD degree and a PhD in anthropology. And that's where I met Paul Farmer in 1983. And uh, we founded this organization, Partners in Health, in around 1987. Uh, and uh, that's when we really started asking this question. And for me, the most important step was to move away from identity politics and toward this bigger question of, OK, so yes, I'm an Asian American. Yes, I've had these experiences of being slapped in the face. I know what racism is like. But come on. My father's a dentist. My mother's a philosopher. I'm getting two degrees from Harvard. Give me a break. And that's basically what Paul said. Paul said, oh, so you're an oppressed minority. Why don't you come with me to Haiti, and let's see what happens there, right? So I went to Haiti, and uh, I thought, you know, the Haitians are going to see me as, like, you know, third world center, right, one of their people. And they immediately started calling me blanc. Blanc means white, but it also just means foreigner. But what it really means is 
You're a guy who can get on a plane and fly here and then fly back whenever you want. Come on, you're blanc in every step and every, in, in every uh, way. They would ask Paul if I was his brother. Not that they didn't know I was Asian, but they didn't know how things worked. You know, maybe I was his brother. And that's when I, uh, I saw just gut-wrenching poverty for the first time in my life. And we, we decided, okay, so it's not identity politics anymore. And I had my identity politics um, uh, 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 flirtation was so deep that I thought the thing that's most important is authenticity. So um, uh, that's, that's what it was all about at the Third World Center at Brown University, authenticity. Hanging black, hanging Latino, hanging Asian, speaking your language, um, uh, speaking black English, speaking Spanish. I didn't speak Korean. I'd forgotten Korean altogether. So while most Korean Americans uh, dealt with their uh, identity crisis by like going a few summers to, to Seoul and hanging out in discos and then coming back and saying, okay, I understand that. I had to get a PhD in anthropology to resolve my identity crisis. Uh, and I actually learned a language and did uh, two and a half years of research in Korea. And what I learned was, okay, so uh, whether I'm Korean or whatever, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really matter. First of all, Korea is doing fine. They don't need me. That's the thing I learned. I thought I was going to go back and I'm going to serve my people because that's what being authentic is all about. And they basically said, ah, actually, we don't need you. And so I came back and I met Paul and we decided that we were going to tackle this problem of poverty and health. But um, uh, we, uh, we kept asking each other questions. And, and, and uh, you know, I'm struck. Uh, Paul Tillich uh, at, said at one point, and I quote, being religious means asking passionately the question of the meaning of our existence and being willing to receive answers, even if the answers hurt. So this is really what we did. We kept asking ourselves, so what do we do? What is to be done? Do we, uh, 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 you know, do we work on this? Do we work on that? And so what we decided was uh, we are going to take our, uh, our inspiration from the liberation theologians and make a preferential option for the poor. We called it O for the P. Uh, and and uh, what does it mean to make an O for the P? The most important thing about an O for the P is it's not an O for other things. It's not an O for, it's not an option for your own ideas. It's not an option for your own efficacy. And that's what, that's what so many young people, they, wanted, they would come to us and they said, I want to go and I want to treat patients and I want to feel heroic. They wouldn't say, I want to feel heroic, but that's really what it was. It was not an option for your own heroism. It was not an option for your own political philosophy. It was not an option uh, for unions. It was not an option for any other sort of group. And it, you had to ask yourself, who are the poorest people? And what does it mean to see the world from their perspective? This is why I like uh, what John Sabrino said so much, and I quote again. We will know that in our world there are not just wounded individuals, but crucified peoples, and that we should enflesh mercy accordingly. To react with mercy, then, means to do everything we possibly can to bring them down from the cross. This means working for justice, which is the name love acquires when it comes to entire majorities of people unjustly oppressed and employing in behalf of justice all our, all our intellectual, religious, scientific, and technological energies. So what the, what, what the liberation theologians presented that was so interesting for us was a program. So it wasn't just that you should uh, care for the poor. You know, the liberation theologians would not say, you know, do things that we were seeing all around us. Uh, there were some church groups that would get a bunch of doctors together and they would fly down to uh, a Latin American country, set up shop for two weeks, treat people, and then come back. Right? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's an act of charity. But we saw uh, the, uh, the side effects of those kinds of things all the time. They would come and bring medicines, and the medicines would run out. They would come and do surgeries, and there would be complications from the surgeries after they left. So what does it mean? It felt to us like that was a, making a preferential option for one's own generosity, for one's own charity. And it's different from making a preferential option for the poor, we thought. So that's why every time the Partners in Health went to a poor community, we have not left. Uh, and we continue to try to work in those poor communities. Now, in the middle of all that, I kept thinking, but doesn't a preferential option for the poor mean all the poor? Because, and, and this is an argument that Paul and I had all the time. It's not enough to make a preferential option for my poor. It's a preferential option for the poor. What does that mean? And so uh, Paul and I sort of uh, divided up the work. 
Paul really liked doing work with patients, and so he kept building clinics and building programs. And I just was obsessed with this notion that it's the poor, not my poor. And so I started getting involved in policy, and I went to the World Health Organization and worked with the, I, I was just blown away by the ACT UP movement in, uh, in a lot of it here in New York City. I couldn't believe how effective they were because they had nothing to lose and they were, uh, they changed the world completely. They changed the way we uh, approve drugs. They changed uh, what we think about, um, uh, about the possibility of doing things that, uh, like treating HIV in Africa. So I went there and I started something called the three by five movement. And it was the craziest, movement ever in the history of the World Health Organization. And we said, let's go from almost zero patients being treated for HIV to three million uh, in a period of two and a half years. And we didn't make, the, we didn't make it, but we made it about a, a year and a half later. And it taught me that if you're really going to make an option for the poor, you've got to think about how to actually make it for the poor. So at, uh, we started in 2003 when there were literally uh, about 20,000 patients being treated for HIV in Africa. Now there are 13 million because we, we, we set targets, we changed uh, the way people think about what's possible. And so for me, setting that target, 3 million by 2005, changed everything and holding people accountable. And so I began to think, so who knows about this stuff? Who knows about how to take things to scale? And I began working with people in the business community. Uh, uh, militaries, businesses know how to take things to scale much more than doctors or um, you know, other kinds of do-gooders. Now, after that WHO experience, I came back and I tried to, to, to the United States and I tried to think about, okay, so how do we take this knowledge of setting targets and, you, and, and, and improving delivery so that we can reach scale? How do we do that in a university setting? And that's why I ended up going to Dartmouth because Dartmouth uh, has uh, some of the best work in the world on how to improve healthcare systems. But then um, three years into my term, um, I got a call from Tim Geithner. Tim Geithner at the time was Secretary of the Treasury, uh, but he's also Dartmouth class of 1983, and I'd known him through Dartmouth, and every time he called me in the past, it was usually to try to see if I could um, uh, admit one of his friend's kids to Dartmouth. That's what I thought he was calling me about, but he, he called me and he said, hey Jim, how would you like to be president of the World Bank? And uh, uh, during my time in Partners in Health, we had done a whole critique, and I was part of a movement called 50 Years is Enough, in which we tried to close the World Bank on its 50th anniversary in 1994. We were in the streets. I, wrote a, you know, I edited an entire volume called Dying for Growth, Global Inequality and the Health of the Poor, which was a 500-page critique of the World Bank. So I said, Tim, but you know what I've done? He goes, yeah, but just come down. Come down and meet with the president. So I came down. And I met first with his vetting team, and they had, they had Dying for Growth, and they had read every page of it. They'd dog-eared it, they'd marked it, and I said, oh, so I'm, I'm disqualified, right? He goes, oh, no, not, not at all. And, and I truly think it's only President Obama who ever would have uh, even considered me for this job. But I walked into his office, um, and he said, so, Jim, why on earth would I give, make you the nominee for the World Bank? You know, everyone's telling me I should nominate a macroeconomist. Why should I nominate you? And so I had been obsessed with President Obama, with Barack Obama since 2004. And so I said to him, I said, uh, President Obama, have you ever read your mother's PhD dissertation? He looked at me and he said, well, well, yeah, I have. And I had been like one of five people who uh, ordered her dissertation from the University of Michigan archives. And I'd read the whole thing. She's, she was an anthropologist, right? I said, you'll remember that, that um, the entire world said that globalization was going to lead to the wiping out of the Indonesian artisanal industry. And she showed that globalization actually led to the explosion of the Indonesian artisanal industry. He said, that's what I'm going to give you, President Obama. I, I'm not going to give you the 30,000-foot view of the macroeconomist, but I've been on the ground working for 25 years, and uh, I'm going to tell you what's actually happening on the ground. He looked at me and he said, I get that. I get that. Uh, I didn't change course. The minute I got in there, I asked the board to set a real target. So we set this target of ending extreme poverty by 2030, and, uh, and I didn't know that we'd actually get there, but then they said, let's not just set a target for poverty, let's set a target for inequality. It's really hard to set a target for inequality, and our, uh, the best economists at the bank worked on this for three or four months. What we came up with was end extreme poverty by 2030, but we were specific. We don't think we can ever get it below 3%. 
because of natural disasters and uh, um, the, the, the vicissitudes of politics, you cannot get it below 3%. So that's the goal, get it below 3%. And then uh, we, we set a goal of boosting shared prosperity. It's really hard to measure inequality because we don't know how rich the rich are in almost any country in the world. We really can't measure directly inequality because we don't know much about the rich. So what we're focusing on is boosting the, the growth in income of the bottom 40%. So uh, end extreme poverty, boost share prosperity. Now, the revelation for me, uh, the revelation for me was that uh, I had no idea how powerful finance was in tackling these problems. You know, in, in everything we'd done before, it was, here's a problem, HIV, we need more money, please give us more money, let's, let's treat it. And uh, uh, we could see all the other problems around us. We need roads, you need energy, um, you need so many other things. And, and we, we knew that you needed to do these things, but I just, I didn't understand how finance works. So at the, at, at the bank, uh, with these two targets, now we have stepped back and we're saying, so how do you take on some of the most difficult problems in the world? And let me go through three of them and wh how we're approaching this. Pandemics. Uh, Ebola and Zika have taught us that we're completely unprepared for pandemics. If a 1918 stuff flu pandemic hits, we're talking about uh, tens of millions of people dead and 5% uh, of the global GDP that would be lost. That's about $4 trillion, right? So this is... The, the insurance companies say this is the worst potential downside risk for them and for the entire world, but we're completely unprepared. Turns out what we really need is finance. So we are, we are now developing an insurance instrument, finally, that will immediately disperse when a pandemic starts. We've never had this before because nobody in the global health world knew how to talk to the people in the insurance world. Finally, we've done that. On climate change. I was just in two countries, Pakistan and Vietnam. Uh, by the way, the World Bank was not a very good player in, 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 uh, in climate change and the environment uh, for, for a very, very long time. Uh, but at the COP21 agreement in, uh, in Paris, uh, we came up and we uh, pledged to spend $29 billion a year by 2020 on climate change. And so the World Bank will be by far the largest contributor to climate change activities in the world. And yet, I was just in Pakistan in Vietnam, and they're about to put online tons of coal-powered uh, uh, electricity. In Vietnam, they're about to put 40 gigawatts of coal-powered electricity online. 40 gigawatts, that's half of all the energy in Sub-Saharan Africa. There's only 80 gigawatts in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Vietnam's gonna put 40 megawatts, I mean gigawatts of, uh, of coal. And I said, why are you doing this? Why don't you, th you, know, why don't you consider renewables? And they said, it's too expensive. Coal is nine cents a kilowatt hour. Renewables in Vietnam are 12 cents. But in Mexico, just two weeks ago, we put a deal together that um, uh, is going to provide solar-based electrical power for 3.2 cents a kilowatt hour. Right? So what's going on? It's just that nobody put the deal together. So guess what we're doing? Uh, and, and this is how we're going to tackle climate change. It's, look, you know, uh, these great agreements are fine. But if Vietnam puts 40 gigawatts of coal power online, forget 1.5. We're not going to get there. So what we're doing is we're running like crazy now. And it's, 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 not, it's not commitment. It's not understanding the science. It's putting the deal together. And, and I don't know if there are business people here, but it's just finding concessional capital, concessional, concessional finance, putting down risk capital, getting off-taker agreements, getting the policy environment right, crowding in private sector, and you get three and a half, four and a half, five cents a kilowatt hour. It's just, it's just hard to, do, you know, you've got to just have the expertise to be able to do it. That's what we do at the World Bank Group, right? So uh, uh, we think that we can make progress, but if we don't move quickly on putting these deals together, forget it. We're at two degrees Celsius, and given the speed with which the Arctic is melting right now, I'm, I'm extremely worried about what's going to happen. We're talking about double the sea level rise that we thought before, given what's happening right now. Forced displacement, right? So in, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, it turns out that the most important thing that we can do, that anyone can do right now, is create jobs and create jobs in the private sector. Every single public sector in every single country in the Arab world is stretched to the limits. 
uh, Saudi Arabia is in big trouble because you know, Saudi Arabia has very low production cost of oil, but they're not, their break-even point for their budget it requires about $60 a barrel and we're at 30. So there's just trouble everywhere. And it turns out we have to now go through this whole process of convincing all of these Latin American countries that growing jobs in the private sector is something that we're gonna do. So, but we're doing it. Uh, we have a, a special project in Jordan uh, that uh, is gonna create a special economic zone so that Syrians and Jordanians can work at the same time. And again, this is not rocket science, but it's, it's, it's uh, putting finance and expertise together in a way that actually creates jobs. And so for me, uh, for me uh, uh, now that it's not just tackling a particular problem or making a particular critique, I, have to actually, I actually own these problems. So if the Middle East falls apart, there are no jobs, I have a huge amount of responsibility there. If we don't uh, uh, tackle climate change in a way that's aggressive enough to keep the warming down, I have responsibility. If we don't stop a pandemic, especially since I'm an infectious disease doctor, I'll bear a huge amount of the blame. And the key is finance. It's utilizing the tools of the wealthy, utilizing balance sheets, utilizing leverage, the tools of the wealthy in order to serve the poor. Now, I, I, I got carried away and I, I spoke too long, um, uh, but let, let, me, let me end by saying this. Uh, the evolution that I've gone through is starting with um, uh, clear moral foundations, being angry about injustice in the world, but then now being in a position where I have to own these problems. I have to come up with solutions for the whole problem, not one part of it or not this part of it. And if you're serious about making a preferential option for the poor, the thing I've learned is you have to understand leverage. You have to understand balance sheet. You have to understand swaps. You have to understand how finance makes this world go around. You have to understand how to create jobs. So uh, the reach out that we've done to the faith-based community, uh, uh, the reason we're doing it is because there is no way for us to be able to reach all the targets around health, education, without the faith-based community. And you know, in the, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, Church-related institutions are 70% of healthcare. In Tanzania, 48% of healthcare. So faith-based institutions are critical, even in just the delivery of what we're doing. But let me put a different challenge to you. Uh, I hear the debates that are going around. Um, you know, uh, uh, you hear a lot in the United States that all trade agreements are bad. Well, do you know trade helps proportionately the poorest countries the most? So if you're making a preferential option for your poor in some part of the United States, you're against trade. But if you're making a preferential option for the poor, you have to be for trade. Trade is the only way that, that rich people exchange things with poor people. You need trade. So um, uh, I would urge you to, to, to come and work with us. Look at the evidence we have and put your own uh, most tightly held ideas to the scrutiny of the data and evidence we have about how to actually end poverty. Because it takes us away from ideology versus ideology and one in which we say, okay, the moral foundations are clear, what's now the evidence for how to solve the problem? That's what we're tr trying to do. That's what we hope that uh, all of you will do with us uh, for many years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>
a moral imperative that is deeply ingrained in all of the world's great religions. Thank you also for highlighting the intersections of poverty, conflict, discrimination, displacement, climate change, and health. All of these issues are not only um, connected for the world that you are operating in, but right here in New York City. You are so right to also remind us that we can only break these cycles when we cultivate a deep empathy and compassion for those among us who are struggling. The challenge of working together to end extreme poverty begins at the personal level in our hearts. The great Muslim mystic scholar Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi taught us that infinite mercy flows continuously, continually, but you are asleep and can't see it. I believe that most of us in the world today are asleep as individuals and as institutions. And this lack of awareness accrued over time is what has created the world as we know it today. We have to be engaged in reminding ourselves and one another of divine mercy. Forums like this help us to wake up and they connect us on that playing field where God's mercy is imminent. The Holy Quran, Islam's sacred text tells us, call upon Allah or call upon Al-Rahman, the merciful, the gracious. These are among two of the beautiful 99 names of God. As a Muslim, I'm asked to remember the essentially compassionate nature of God in my five daily prayers reciting in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. I'm asked to begin each action with reconnecting to this divine compassion. Through this restating of a very simple expression, I align myself and reground myself with the understanding that everything in our world is fundamentally interconnected. Humanity is interconnected and this interconnection mirrors the unity and oneness of God. It's only when my own heart is awake that I can bring mercy into my relationships. To live Islam in this world and to translate into action, I'm asked to follow the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a man that the Quran teaches us was sent as a mercy to all of humanity. This is the man who taught us, by example, the importance of giving charity and zakat, who had very little that he owned, but never hesitated to give away even the last date fruit that he had in his home. This is the man who taught us that if one plants something or sows a seed from which a man, a bird, or an animal eats, it counts as charity. This is also the man who taught us whoever alleviates the situation of one in dire straits who cannot repay his debt, God will alleviate his lot in this world and in the hereafter. Through efforts of leaders such as Dr. Kim, it also becomes possible to infuse mercy into policies and programs. And I wanna thank the World Bank here, especially for your debt relief initiatives. <laughs> um, the interconnections between us in academic terms is called social cohesion. It, what, it's what makes violence, it, it's what reduces violence and also makes democratic governance possible. Here in New York City, Mayor de Blasio has committed to working in partnership with faith communities, and I'm part of the Community Affairs Unit where we have a chance to do that every day. Um, the mayor's housing plan, as you talked about harnessing finance, uh, recently incorporated mandatory inclusionary um, housing, which is a program that harnesses market forces to build affordable housing for New Yorkers. The Clergy Advisory Council, for the first time in New York City's history, is working with, as a structure to work with faith communities, and I wanted to uh, acknowledge Serene Jones and Fred Davey, who are both part of that. Um, another program we've implemented here in New York is the ID card to give every New Yorker a municipal ID, 
uh, in particular undocumented immigrants and immigrants who, as you pointed out, are so vital to the economy uh, of our city and of cities everywhere. In addition, we recently have launched, the mayor and the first lady have launched an initiative called Thrive NYC, which is a major mental health initiative to educate New Yorkers about mental illness and to improve access to care. And as we know, people who are poor are the ones who face the most difficulty in accessing mental health care. And it's compounded by the difficulty of mental illness stigma. And lack of proper care can also exacerbate, exacerbate economic disempowerment. And the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs is actually working over the next few weeks to reach out to faith communities to partner in a mental health faith weekend uh, on May 20th and 22nd where we'll be asking faith leaders to educate their communities about mental illness. Partnerships like these are essential to achieving our goal of addressing extreme poverty and to meet many of our development goals. And I'm grateful to be working in an administration that has embraced the importance of partnership with religious leaders. I wanted to close with a quote that I have on my desk to remind me about the importance of collaboration. It says, collaborate, be the light that others can come to with their ideas, visions, and dreams. Never doubt that blending your talents with those of others can change the world. I believe that faith communities and religious leaders are a light for us. And working in partnership, we can change the world together. Thank you. And now Ruth Messenger, President of the American Jewish World Service. Thank you, good evening. I want to uh, join Sarah in thanking the sponsors of this evening, but I most particularly want to thank Dr. Kim, not just for your remarks, but for your extraordinary world leadership in so many fields, and for what you are doing at the bank, for your effort to change the policies and practices of an international financial institution and get it to commit to the moral imperative of ending extreme poverty by 2030. The goal is powerful, the process of moving the bank and other institutions and world leaders to address these issues is amazing. And I think all of us in all of the faith communities represented here and elsewhere are appreciative of your recognizing the power of faith-based communities to join with you in this effort, but as you've said very clearly at the, on the faith-based task force, to look at the evidence, to do what works, um, and to work collaboratively with each other, with the people who are most affected, with the people who deserve that preference for the poor, all of the poor, and to make sure that this is a conjoint effort. So in my remarks, I want to say that I recognize how much you're already doing, and I love that you highlighted this notion of mercy. But I listened in your first introduction we're all familiar with the title of a current and powerful book about racism, Just Mercy, in which Brian Stevenson clearly didn't just mean just mercy, he meant just mercy as in fair. And so I want to, uh, drawing from my own faith-based um, background, say that chesed or compassion or caring is critical, but so is being sure that we work for justice. And as you know, because we've talked about it, the world is full of unequal power dynamics that have to be addressed by all of us. And you've spoken to the ways in which financial levers turn out to be quite a lot stronger than some other levers, that investing money in a project, that doing what the bank does, but looking at where you make those investments can make a huge difference in people's lives. But as the bank, as world powers, as governments step on the scales to correct those imbalances and to put money in places where it's needed, I want to be sure, speaking from the faith-based community, that we're all committed not just to compassion and caring, but to justice and to human rights. 
And to take a practical example, and I know you know all of these, but there are places in the world where American Jewish World Service works where the wise investment of some corporations to create new economic opportunities for some and new economic levels for some countries ends up hurting some of the poor. And, you know, for us right now, the most powerful example is in Honduras, where community land activists have fought to protect their land and their water. It's a particularly powerful example because for them, both their land and their rivers are a source of their religious strength. And the balance, and I'm going to leave this as a, as a challenge for every, all of us, but the balance between investing there by a multinational corporation making investments to create additional hydropower can bring economic improvements to some people. But if it does that at the cost of taking away the land for people for whom that is a source of their religious strength, their own notion of economy, and their own notion of justice, then that's another way in which I think the scales have to be addressed or corrected. And we're seeing in the world, and I mentioned this example with some pain, because it's not just who is on which side and how does compassion and caring weigh with justice and human rights, we're seeing the murders last week of two, last two weeks of two of the activists in this particular community for standing up for their religion and their people and their land. So for me, you mentioned it when you first quoted the principle of mercy, but I guess for, I just want to be sure that financial powers and financial investments are held accountable to justice and to human rights, as well as providing mercy. And two quotes to close with. I think this is what Dr. King meant when he said that true compassion is more than flinging a coin at a beggar. It comes to see that the society that has, produces beggars, needs restructuring. How do we restructure so that not only that beggar gets some money, but so that there are fewer beggars? And then for me, as my friends in the audience know, um, I have to quote Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, and I can do that well here because he taught at the seminary and at Union. Um, and he said, we are ashamed of the inadequacy of our anguish, of how faint and slight is our mercy. But then he went on to say, we are a generation that has lost its capacity for outrage. That's the commitment to action that you were calling on all of us to join in with you. And he went on to say, we must continue to remind ourselves that in a free society where terrible wrongs exist, some are guilty, but all are responsible. And I think it's investing in that sense of responsibility to be sure that financial investments, national public policies, multinational activities recognize both mercy and justice and use human rights as a standard for investment is critical. Thank you. We have a short amount of time for questions, um, but thankfully, uh, Dr. Kim has agreed to take some. And I want to start um, by asking, um, and this will also prompt uh, an opportunity to respond to what I think was a very powerful point uh, and, and challenge in a way raised by Ruth Messenger. Um, the financial tools that you um, objected to when you were protesting the World Bank, meaning a reliance on GDP, um, are some of the ways of measuring poverty that go by dollars per day also uh, vulnerable in the same way uh, to missing some of the things that matter to well-being? And um, in this sense, is there a way in which poverty can be measured also by access to a clean environment, for instance? Um, and certainly the situation in Honduras would also be a point in which you could discuss that. Thank you. 
So the, the um, Ruth, you're talking, you know, you're you're referring to Ms. Caceres and the and the others. It, it's a it's an incredibly tragic situation. We we were not involved in in, in, in that in that area at all. Uh, and we, but we have been involved with the, the government of Honduras on other issues, other investments that we had made there, and it's troubling. I mean, you know, uh, Jan Sabrino was in a in a place where, for many many years, we had supported a sort of series of of uh, dictators, and um, that's not gone away. So, um, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, that we're facing all the time is, do you continue to work in a place? where there are these kinds of problems. And so um, Jim Wolfenson, one of my predecessors, uh, and, uh, and a good friend of the, of the uh, Jewish Theological Seminary, said in 1996 when he first took over that he was gonna bring up the term corruption. He was gonna give a speech and he was gonna say that we've gotta fight the cancer of corruption. And everyone in the World Bank, all of his vice presidents said, you cannot say that. You cannot mention that word. He says, why not? They said, because everyone we work with is corrupt. We will have nobody to work with anymore, right? And so Jim said, too bad, I'm gonna do it anyway. And he did, and it started a whole process where now we have, and it, it, the, we are told anyway, the best system for rooting out corruption in our, in our projects that, that we could possibly have. Now we have uh, uh, economic and, and uh, social safeguards, and we're going through a whole process, but uh, the, 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 the difficulty is that in our articles of agreement, it, it says that we cannot be political. So we have 188 member countries, and you can imagine there are very different views about whether we can or cannot be a human rights-based organization. And for the vast majority of the, of the, of the members, uh, being a human rights organization is going beyond the articles of agreement. So we're now uh, managing that right now, and what we're trying to do is to find workarounds, things that we all agree on. So um, uh, I had a very similar experience to Jim. There was a, uh, in Uganda, uh, they had passed this law that said that not only is it illegal to be homosexual, if, you, if you're convicted of homosexuality, you go to prison for life, but you can go to prison if you fail to report homosexual behavior. And so that came out, and um, uh, we were just about to approve a $90 million um, uh, concessional loan to Uganda for a health facility. And I said, wait a minute. I said, can we make sure that, that discrimination, not even discrimination, but endangerment won't happen in this project? And so they, they, my, the vice presidents, the directors, they all said, well, um, uh, yes. And I said, how? And, and it was clear. They said, well, there's a doctor-patient uh, uh, privilege. And I said, but is there janitor-patient privilege? Because they're all required to report homosexual behavior. And so we stopped the loan. And it was the exact same thing. Uh, everybody, literally everybody at the World Bank said, you cannot stop this loan. I said, why? It's because there are 84 countries in the world in which homosexuality is illegal. What, are you going to stop working in all those places? I said, no, but we've got to find a way forward. So the way forward was to say, um, and I had to have a meeting with my board right afterwards, right after we did this, and I said, look, here's the principle. The principle is that I cannot in good conscience provide a loan for health clinics that could end up not only discriminating against but endangering a group of people. That's, that's discrimination, outright discrimination. So amazingly, the board said, okay, we can agree with you that we can't support uh, overt discrimination. But that was the first step. That was the first step. And what they, everybody told me, you know, this is gonna be terrible, the leaders are gonna come and they're gonna yell and scream at you. But then about two weeks later, uh, a minister of finance from an African country uh, came uh, uh, and insisted on seeing me, right? And I didn't know why. I said, can you tell me? Well, no, I can't, but he needs a one-on-one. -on -one. He needs to see you. He came to me and he said, I just bring in a message from my prime minister. There's, there's a, a severe anti-gay legislation going through the parliament right now, and he wanted you to know that he's never going to let that pass, right? We were the only ones. It turned out we were the only ones that stopped the flow of money, right? Now, Ruth, I'm not going to tell you this is going to be easy, right? But uh, this is a conversation we have to have. So one of the issues is resettlement, right? When you build a road, you have to resettle people. Right? And uh, there was this big movement to say, well, you should stop all your projects that have to resettle people, right? And I said, okay. I was with a group of people. I said, how many of you came in on the highway today, right? How many of you used an airport in the last week? 
In every single one of those projects in the United States, people used eminent domain and resettled people. It's the cost of building a city, right? So I, uh, what we do at the bank, um, our policy is not only do we settle people who uh, have title to the land, we settle squatters, right? So what happens when we announce that something is gonna be built in some part of the world? People storm in because they know that we will resettle them, right? And it's the cost for us of doing business. That's why it's more expensive often to do business with us. Uh, you know, uh, climate change is a, is a terrible, horrible situation, but people need energy, right? Are, are, you, are we really in, in the situation in Honduras with, uh, with uh, uh, hydropower? I know there's a lot of critique of hydropower, but they're gonna have, they're gonna put power in place anyway. Do we, do we, do, if we go to Africa and say, okay, no hydropower, no nuclear, right? Uh, and no coal, but we want you to have power. It's not serious. You're not being serious. We're not doing coal, and we're gonna try it like crazy to go to, to solar, but what these people are saying is, we have a right to develop too. Now, it's always gonna be a conversation. I think our commitment is to hear the voices of the Berticaceruses of the world. We have to hear those voices. Uh, uh, and what we've now been able to do is to say, okay, so we, in this case, instead of coal, we're gonna do hydro, but we'll do hydro in a way that everyone is resettled um, in a situation that's better than the situation they were living in, as good as or better. I, 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 you know, for, we cannot step back and say, okay, this is too controversial, so all of you, you're not gonna have energy, right? Because what they'll say is that's, that's a human rights violation too. You may feel more comfortable uh, uh, with your political ideas about the rights of people to land, but all these people are not gonna have jobs because there's no energy. So that's the conversation we're trying to have. And the way that I approach it is this, if we're doing something that's really bad and it's really offending or really uh, uh, taking livelihoods away, we will, we, you tell us what it is, we'll stop it and we'll try to make it right. Because this work is just, it, you cannot do the kind of work we're trying to do and not have some of these incidents happen. We just have to be honest about when it happens, admit it, and then try to fix it as best we can, right? Now, um, in, uh, uh, in, in terms of the, the financial instruments, right, uh, what I objected to, Karina, was that, that GDP growth uh, was pr privileged over everything else, and health and education were seen as expenses that you, that you um, uh, invest in later, and that was our critique. Now, um, we, we are looking at GDP in terms of extreme poverty because there's just not any other well um, uh, agreed to um, measure. But we are now uh, looking at um, uh, changing fundamentally and Amartya Sen and others are, are working with us. We will have other measures. Right? But uh, GDP per capita uh, is just the one thing that we could all agree that we should track. It's not the only thing we're tracking, but um, it, it, it's really important to have something that you can actually track that keeps people uh, 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 accountable. Do we have more questions? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. I, I want to ask um, one more question that came from the union community. Um, and thank you to everyone who submitted them. We will be passing them on to Dr. Kim, uh, even, if, even though they can't get asked tonight. Um, about women. Um, in particular, women's, uh, the inequality of women around the world is something that you've spoken mm -hmm. about eloquently. And um, traditionally women's work, caring for children, is difficult to, to monetize and maybe not advisable in some ways. How do you um, push for equality for women while also honoring and valuing uh, the traditional work that women have done? Yeah, um, uh, I, I, um, I, I actually, don't understand, I mean, so okay. uh, in, from the bank perspective? Yes, yeah. from the bank perspective. Um, it's something that I thought you had spoken about uh, before, that that was right. part of, part of right. how you looked into doing. So, uh, you know, there's, there's um, this, is, this is an extremely complicated topic for us, right? Because um, there are very different, um, uh, what should I say, cultures inside the World Bank Group. And um, uh, the way that we're approaching this is that, um, uh, uh, that um, uh, every single project we do, we now look at the impact that it has on women. Right? Now, um, you can imagine the kind of pushback we get 
what they, what, what they say is, if you focus too much on, uh, on particular visions of what women should do and, and, and how women should act, you're becoming political and you're, in, you're, you're making cultural judgments. So uh, in, I have my personal views of, uh, uh, about um, uh, gender equality, uh, but in terms of the World Bank, what we're, what we're doing is providing the economic evidence for the importance of, uh, of women being able to work. Right? Uh, we do a lot on gender-based uh, gender violence. I mean, we, we, uh, the, uh, one of our biggest projects in, uh, in the uh, Great Lakes region is one that's specifically focused on gender-based violence, and we found that, uh, um, that, uh, that, that that's been, effect that been, been very helpful. Uh, so, yes, on a personal level, we very much honor the work, the traditional work that, that, that women have done. Have we found a way of, maybe, I, I, maybe you're asking, are we compensating it, are we providing? I, 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 we have come a huge long way in terms of uh, being able to talk about gender equality and the way that um, uh, this is going forward is that for, at first, the first step was to say, uh, look at every single project and see if we've even thought about gender, gender informed. But now the next step is to look specifically at the impact that it's having on uh, women's access to healthcare, access to education, uh, uh, access to all the things that we're providing. And we're gonna get a number for every single project of ours. And it's, it's very surprising because it's the fact that we're, we're, we're forcing governments to look at that, many of them have never done that before. And uh, uh, we, you know, we hope to make progress. Uh, th there are some real bright spots. I mean, in Japan, they, they, um, uh, they, uh, they decided that one of the things that they needed to do in terms of structural reform is to bring, is to give women an opportunity to work if they want. And they did this by scaling up daycare, they did it by uh, changing the rules in terms of women's participation on boards and in, uh, in, in the business sector, and they've actually increased women's participation in the labor force. And um, if it's like, the, it's like the biggest uh, 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 cultural shift that they've ever gone through in that regard, and we will keep pushing on that agenda. Hard question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much that, for your time tonight and for your wonderful... Sorry. Um, we have to, they're, they're saying I have to go. Okay. All right. Dr. Jim Kim, as you make your uh, unfortunately, uh, hasty departure. We know your day is not yet finished. Uh, Dr. Kim just arrived from overseas and has yet still more appointments this evening on his way uh, out of the city. We want to thank you on behalf of the Union Theological Seminary, uh, the Riverside Church, and the Jewish Theological Seminary. Uh, we are indebted to your time with us. Uh, I want to thank uh, my uh, collaborators, uh, Rabbi Bert Vysotsky uh, and uh, Christian Peel from Riverside, for all the work that we've uh, been a part of to make this evening come together. Once again, we thank all of you. And as has been said, and I don't want this to be underestimated, uh, the questions that have been submitted online and otherwise, we uh, assure you we'll make sure that they are uh, directed to uh, Dr. Kim's office uh, at the World Bank. Thank you again so very much. Uh, blessings upon you as you go forth this evening.